I'm a feminist, but today we drove from Brisbane to the Gold Coast in our tour bus, and Grace Petrie, the brilliant singer who's going to be on later tonight, who is on tour with us from the UK, she looked up at the ceiling of this van that we'd got, and she said, every time I tour with you, the tour van has a see-through sunroof. And I realised that every time I ask Grace to go anywhere with me, I accidentally provide a glass ceiling. <laughs> Just looking up, thinking, yeah, I'll never break through that. <laughs> I like that. Feminist glass ceiling. <laughs> uh, I'm a feminist, but I really get pissed off if my boyfriend doesn't carry my shit for me. <laughs> Like, the other day, all right, so he picks me up. I was in Perth doing Perth shows, and I was away for three weeks, and I was missing him. And then I came back, he picked me up from the airport, and I'm there with my bags, and I'm like, he's going to he's gonna get out of the car, and he's going to give me a big kiss and a cuddle, and everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, he definitely loves her. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then when we, when we got there, like, I had all my bags, and I was about to take them into the boot, and he started to open his door, and I thought he was going to help me put them away, and he opened his door just to amplify him yelling, back seat. <laughs> wow. For me to put my bags in the back seat. Wow. And then I, when I got inside, I was like, you're not going to help me put my bags in? And he's like, you're capable. Like, I'm going to get in trouble if I get out of the car because we're at the airport. They'll shoot you along. And I was pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but the last time I lived on the Gold Coast, I was a Jehovah's Witness and believed that women should be in subjection to men. <laughs> True story. And, and by the way, you weren't allowed to date anyone. Well, we didn't call it dating. We called it courting because it was 1842. <laughs> and you weren't allowed to court anybody. You weren't allowed to court a brother unless it was with a view to marriage. So you didn't have to marry them, but you had to be, that had to be on your mind. You couldn't just like date someone because you were a young hormonal person who wow. fancied people. I remember a brother once saying to me, I could never marry you because you wouldn't be in subjection. You wouldn't let me be the head of the household. Well spotted, Brother Darren. I would not. <laughs> I would not. <laughs> I was always... I never liked that part. And I always used to have feminist arguments with people. I was always a feminist. Wow. And I'd always be looking for proof in the Bible that God wasn't a misogynist. There's very little. Um, <laughs> But you could find your passages, you know. Um, you can find anything in the Bible if you look hard enough. And also, you can find passages any time if you look hard enough, too. <laughs> <laughs> With an eye to marriage. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, so, so... Why did you get me on this show? I don't know. You're an idiot! <laughs> I, don't, I don't know in retrospect. No, I do know. I do know. You're amazing. So I always used to argue about it. I mean, I was very discreet about who I told... I wasn't actually. I was very discreet about when I said it. Mm. A secret is something you tell one person at a time. So I used to spread my feminist message, my feminist gospel, to one witness at a time. I'd especially try and work women up into a sort of fury about why we That's had no... amazing. Yeah, why yeah. we had no uh, agency. You know when people... Uh, like, I don't like when people get a mission just because they figure that having a mission will help them achieve a goal of something like fame or money, right? Mm -hmm. I just really like that that's always been a part of who you are and that you felt empowered and like you wanted to empower other people around you from a young age. I did. It didn't really work, if I'm honest. <laughs> I, women would always say to me, oh, you shouldn't say those things or Jehovah's Righteous Arrangement, that I think men were in subjection to Jesus, Jesus was in subjection to God and women were in subjection to men. Although we did have one quite woke circuit overseer. We didn't call... Circuit overseers woke then. Um, it wasn't a word in the vernacular. And circuit overseers, I think we need to be incredibly clear, are not woke. Uh, they are travelling elders who go around making sure that the local elders, who are the body of men in the congregation who make all the decisions for all the women, um, would... So this elder would get on a circuit, basically, like a comedian. You know, we have a circuit. You go to all the different gigs. Yeah. But he'd go all the different congregations and just basically spy on everyone and make sure that they were towing the line. And then his poor wife, they always had a wife, they would just call the circuit overseer's wife. Wow. And that was their official job title. Can you imagine wife being in a job title? It's so Handmaid's Tale. Anyway, this one circuit overseer at my pioneer school said, because there was some young brother there who thought he was hot shit. Yeah. And uh, he wasn't. And he was going on about how we had to be in subjection to him. 
and we were all single. We were all, you know, like late teens single, early 20s, late teens single. And this circuit overseer said, let me clear that up for you. Women are in subjection to their husbands, but if you're a single man, you only have dominion over the animals. <laughs> this is a really good joke if you're a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> Sadly, you're not, because you wouldn't be allowed to come to an event with feminist in the title. Do you think that there are secretly... <gasps> well, I don't know. Is Jehovah's anyone secretly Witness. a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> we won't tell. We promise. Any, anyone, anyone secretly? They're not going to say, though, No, are they? they won't. They might say afterwards. They might say, if you are secretly a Jehovah's Witness, come up afterwards and we will take you to a safe house. <laughs> <laughs> you do, have you, have you do another one? Okay. Uh, I'm a feminist and I think it is super important as a professional woman to always conduct myself with professionalism. I like to be on time. But... I was late today because I wanted a quickie. We're not going to do better than that. Live from Miami, Marquette, on the Gold Coast. talking about invisibility. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. My name is Sarah Francis White. I'm here with Steph Tisdall, and today we're talking about invisibility. <laughs> Steph. G'day. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. You smell amazing. Just she smells really good. So keep that that's just for the podcast. Yeah. Just so if you're listening globally, I smell amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, Chanel Chance with a hint of citrus. Um, sure. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you smell good too, just to be clear. No, I just, nah, I, just I, I had pit smell before, so that's what I told you. I don't... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's just my natural pheromones. <laughs> They can't see that I'm smiling. They listen to a podcast going, she's a stinky bitch. Um, <laughs> Nobody's thinking that or saying that because it's a feminist podcast. <laughs> They'll be saying, not a bitch. Like Thank that, you. yeah. But you're using that colloquially. That's right. That's right. Be with an itch, yeah. Um, you said, actually... <laughs> I don't think you could just say be with an itch and make that no, word it okay. No, it does. That's like saying see with an unt. Yeah. Uh, you can't just go, oh, well, I'm now not offended. Well, like... Uh, I feel like, um, because I was on here last night, I'm now an expert, and I have written that bitches is, is not anti-feminist if you say be with bitch. <laughs> okay, who made that rule? I, I think it's... Um, <laughs> no, but you said something earlier, Deb, that was my favourite way that anybody's ever described my relationship with my boyfriend, because he's very serious, mm. and I always feel like I have to tell people when we're out, I promise he loves me. <laughs> because I'm a total fool and I'm real goofy. What, like, I get nervous around other people. And then you said, no, 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 it's a nice relationship. You've just got that screwball comedy thing going where he's the straight one and you're the goofball. Yes, that is exactly yeah. what I it said. It made me really happy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's clear. But I think at some point <laughs> you start convincing people the other way. Yeah. And I he think loves me. When you say he loves me, he loves me. <laughs> No, he loves, me. he loves me. You love me. Tell them you love me. Yeah. At some point, it kicked. first of all, we're like, oh, that's nice he loves you. Does he love you? He definitely doesn't love you. Like, at, exponentially, that will carry on. I think you're right. Martin, are you in here? Tell me you love me. <laughs> Martin, are you in here? Oh, okay. there he is. Say it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, you didn't have to push it. He just had his own accord. In a very real way, Steph, he did not. I know. He did not. He did not. That's the opposite of his own accord. I know. That's completely of your accord. <laughs> Do you ever feel invisible? All the time. Mostly in my invisibility cloak. Cut that, please. <laughs> um, it's dumb. <laughs> Yes, I feel invisible all the time. Why do you feel invisible? I never leave the house. No, um, I, <laughs> I feel invisible because, well, for a couple of reasons. I think because I am a, um, in your terms, uh, a fatty. Um, I what? 
Hokey <laughs> You never said, I know, that's the word that I, I think that's funny. I sometimes like to say, this was birthed from Cocoa Pops. I'm just like a chocolate milkshake, only chunky. Um, <laughs> so as an Aboriginal woman who is overweight and a comedian, <laughs> I feel like there are a lot of things that don't toe the normal the line. line. Yes. Yeah. I think intersectional feminists now would say fat or fat-bodied as a completely un... Uh, as a, just an adjective. It's just a yeah. thing you can be. It's one of the many things you can yeah. be. So I really do need to underline to everybody that it is not, in my words, a fatty. <laughs> that's... Backstage, Steph was going, well, I call myself a fatty. And I'm like, you can call yourself whatever you want. Like, that's fine. You own... That's why I thought it was funny, but it was bad when I said it. Like, I saw them go... You know, like, yeah, no, well, they were judging sorry. me. I know, that's why they I feel clearly bad. thought backstage I had said that. Man, you should have said that. I really I need in now the room to be. Goes, fat dear boomba. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. No, that's not. <laughs> that never happened. Oh, God. That um, never happened. It really yeah, did. yeah, it yeah. Did. It's, it, it, it's, 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 it's the last thing that happened. Can you unpack a little bit more? Because I completely understand what you're saying. So, can you unpack why that makes you <laughs> invisible? Well, at the same time as making me invisible, it makes me too visible. Mm. Uh, and that's not a joke about my mass. But I, <laughs> when you represent a minority or something that isn't the norm, people want to both ignore you mm. but also can uh, sort of overcompensate or have a level of pity or see you as a representation for what you are. I think the majority person, right, so if we say white man, straight white man, right, we yep. go, cool, that's fine. If we see a straight white man, we never then go, that's a representation of all straight white men because we've had so much representation mm -hmm. that we go, that's just one of many. Yes, but because Indigenous women, for example, there were a lot of preconceived ideas, Absolutely. they may all be projected onto you. Absolutely. And there's also not a lot of representation. And I think, because there's a huge difference then again when it comes to like city or built up areas mm. and then regional areas as well and the representation of... of... So I, I often feel like white people go, all right, an Aboriginal woman is coming out and talking to us. What a good representation of Aboriginal women she is. Mm -hmm. But... We've got over 500 different languages in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. We've got 500 different nations within Australia. I cannot be a representation of all Aboriginal people. I can only ever be a representation of myself. And so in that way, you're both more visible and less visible at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. It's same with being like a, a fat woman. The idea, like, no matter what I do, it's either because I'm feeling empowered in my body or the opposite. Do you know what I mean? Like, I get around wearing... I hang out in my jammies all day. I was wearing pants at the shop the other day and had a big hole in the bum. I didn't give a fuck, right? Because, like, who cares? Do you know what I mean? Like, you, thank you so much. But see, that exact response is like, that's what I mean, right? Like, people might go, she's empowered, or they could look at me wearing whatever the fuck I want to wear because I'm lazy. I was going, oh, she doesn't like herself. So you become invisible and visible at the same mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And having said that, it's so important that you're doing comedy on television now. Absolutely. Because if you are an Aboriginal girl watching television at home and you're five years old, yeah. you think, yeah. oh, that's one of the jobs I could do. I yeah. could do comedian. If you don't see yourself represented, you just think, well, that whole thing is out for me. Yeah. It just is, can even not occur to you to do it. It's not like yeah. you're sitting there going, why can't I do that? It's just like, mm, it's not a thing I can be. It's not there a thing a, I can do. My previous manager, she said to me once, I said, I don't want to get gigs where it's just because I'm a token. I don't want to be the token Aboriginal woman on the stage because what I find is that I'm in an interesting place where I'm a twofer, um, like I'm an Aboriginal person and a woman. Yeah. So I'll be on a lineup and they go, fuck yeah, we don't have to book two women. We'll just get a yeah, black yeah. woman, you know? you know. Like we don't need more diversity. We've got it in one. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, um, you are cheap. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's a, it's a Basic, cheap booking because it's, it's like the price of one. there's exactly. no need to have two women when we can I have one. I feel like this is about my weight now, Deb. Um, <laughs> I never said kidding. <laughs> I am such a C with an aunt. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're going to delete this episode. <laughs> um, no, it'll just be about four minutes long. <laughs> it'll just be those opening titles. <laughs> <laughs> and then good night. Uh, <laughs> what my previous manager said to me was, the thing that you have to remember 
is that it's only tokenism until it just isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And that seems like such a simple thing, but actually it's very, very, very true. And so I think I have a responsibility and also it's not like I have to do this. I want to do this. Couldn't give a fuck what happens with my career except that I want it to help me get to a place where I can encourage other people who have a lack of opportunities. Like There are aspects of my upbringing, my childhood, that also make me feel like I am different from my own community. And I'm in a particularly bizarre situation in that I was incredibly privileged growing up and my biggest issue was that I didn't feel as connected to my culture, which is all that I wanted. And my mum had to make a very, very, very purposeful choice of whether she was going to raise us on our country where she used to get spat on in the street because she was black or whether she was going to raise us to give us opportunities and know that we were going to yearn for culture. And that becomes the question in Australia, that's the truth and still to this day mm. for Aboriginal people in Australia. And it's not a matter of making yourself feel good because you went, I learned how to do an acknowledgement to country today. <laughs> I'm so good. It's so much deeper than that and it's so much more splintered than that and it's very hard to know where I fit within that space. I'm so excited to see the shows you're going to do because you're going to write some incredible hour-long comedy shows that are going to end up as Netflix specials oh, where you're going to be able to explain all of this. No pressure, but you are going to be able to unpack and explain this through comedy. Yeah. And like Hannah Gadsby did with Nanette, mm. it changed everyone's idea of what it was to be marginalised in the way that Hannah's marginalised. Mm. I can't wait to see your show about the nature of being Indigenous for Indigenous people all around the world. Mm. I think this is a really interesting topic, invisibility, because it very much speaks to those intersections, exactly like you said. Can I just chuck in and I'm a feminist, but just because it's just come to my mouth? My yeah. Mind. I'm a feminist, but I'm terrified of other feminists because I feel sometimes not represented in... The conversation and that is really hard because you want to say everything you're saying is valid but also my voice is you have no idea when there's an extra layer how hard it is to give a shit about that mm -hmm. when I just want somebody to take me seriously on this level or hey I see that from a slightly different perspective to you without it seeming like you're undermining a movement. So do you mean like when you hear wealthy white women talking about the pay gap, mm. but they're really talking about the pay gap between wealthy white women and wealthy white men? Yes, absolutely. And they're not seeing those other pay gaps that may exist through yes, race, absolutely. class. I also think, you know, there are really interesting things that people sometimes don't think of as well. Like, so I was born in a, in a uh, place called Mount Isa. Don't boo me. Um, it's... <laughs> It's a mining town and it's really interesting there because what you find is that people really stick to their gender roles and they seek that. It's this weird space and I think areas like that just tend to go that way, like very conservative and they tend to just sort of toe that line. So it's not only just wealthy white women, it's Western wealthy white women and it's like metropolitan, mm -hmm. wealthy white women. Do you know what I mean? I feel personally attacked. I'm so death. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. And we've just got to be really careful of it. It's not to say it's not important, because if the most powerful people in the world can't close the pay gap, it yes. feels like what's the hope for anybody else? Yeah. But if we stop there or we make that the top line and we don't cut down, we're just slicing across the top. Yeah. And the whole news story is about Claire Foy not being paid as much as Matt Smith for The Crown. You guys all fans of The Crown? Yeah. Okay. It's the Gold Coast. Yep. <laughs> no, no, they think you're talking about the casino. No. <laughs> no, they don't. I'm sorry. Excuse me, I'm from the Gold Coast. I watched The Crown. Also, that was really self-deprecating of them to cut. They're like, we do, we love a casino. <laughs> For clapping that and not going, we're, we're walking out. We're walking out. Outraged. It is an important story to say, even at that absolute top level, mm. you always need an example of something. And the best example is going to be the highest profile. And it's a really hard line to not 
alienate mm-hmm. people who fit outside of that because you're all fighting the same fight. Mm. But I think it's very hard to be very inclusive. Like, well, we've got to have a go know. at it. Like we Absolutely. fail at it all the time. We fail at it all the time, but we fail better each time. Yeah. I mean, I really often feel this podcast is built on criticism. And sometimes I get criticism and I think, actually, no, I don't think that's valid. Like, you know, but if it comes from somebody generally in a marginalized group, I'm like, okay, let's listen, let's take that on board, let's see what we can do, and let's yeah. try and... But I just do also think the podcast is more interesting because a lot of things you're saying I've never heard before. Yeah. Whereas if it's continually two white middle-class women... Yep. saying the same things back to each other again and again and again and again in a loop. Yeah. We just sort of, it's lovely being right. And it's, <laughs> we come together sometimes as feminists to go, mm, we're right, aren't we? Aren't we right? Aren't we right? <laughs> We've not changed anything, but we're very right. And I've enjoyed being right this evening with you. Have you enjoyed? I've just loved it. Uh, and then we go away. And I think I'd rather, in a way, as I listen to you go, oh, yeah, Because that's how progress is made. I often think that a completely content person has never changed the world. The first ever piece of technology was the chair, I think. And other people would have definitely gone, when somebody's gone and, you know, seen a stump on the thing and thought, oh, I can sit on that. Other people were definitely going, whoa, why are you so fancy? Why can't you sit on the ground? What's wrong with the ground? You're so right. And somebody was dissatisfied with the ground. That is... (laughs) I'm writing, I'm writing material about this shit right now. I'm like, (laughs) no, I'm stealing it. No, you write it. Right about that. (laughs) You would feel fancy if you were sitting on a log yeah. and everybody else was Yeah, and then someone went, do you know what would be more comfortable? We put a back on that and we found a way to nail a back to this chair. And everyone said, oh, why do you have to have a back on it? And at some point, you have to be dissatisfied with what is here in order yes. to change what's there. And that will always disrupt and other people will always be threatened by it. But then after a while, chairs become normal and nobody's threatened by them and you're not burnt as a witch for making one. <laughs> it's just standard, you know. What I'm saying is metaphorically build a feminist chair where you are. (laughs) Hello, 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 hello. And welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the first time I have performed in front of an audience on the Gold Coast since I was a Jehovah's Witness. Thank you, yes. And then it was mostly just me doing stand-up at parties for other Jehovah's Witnesses. And I would recreate the set, but you wouldn't understand any of the jokes. Unless, of course, you used to be a Jehovah's Witness, in which case, give me a cheer. That's my core demographic on the Gold Coast. Uh, Give us a cheer if you went to school with me. Yeah, great, super. That's most of the audience covered. Uh, I've not done the Gold Coast before. The producer's always gone, oh, I don't know how that'll go. Like, just do two shows in Brisbane. I'm sure people will come up. And uh, this year I was like, no, I need to go back. I need to go back to my home. We did do two shows in Brisbane. There were people from the Gold Coast in those shows. And I explained to them I was playing the Gold Coast. And they said, we know, we don't like it there. We we prefer our feminism off-piste. We like, we don't want to out ourselves as feminists on the Gold Coast. We have gone up to the Brisbane to be secret feminists. When we come back, we're just going to keep it under wraps, gang. Uh, so just give us a cheer if you came up to one of the Brisbane shows. And you're here again. Wow. That's, uh, that's the super fans. And you're in the front row as well. And you're drunk. This is absolute intersection of guilt and feminism right here in the front row. Absolutely amazing. So, yeah, the reason I want to talk about uh, Gold Coast feminism is when I come into any town, I generally Google feminism name of town. And the reason I do that is I want to see if there's maybe a feminist exhibition I should go and see, if there's any activists I should know about, maybe there's a guest that I should have on the show. And when I Googled Gold Coast Queensland feminism, (laughs) I'm going to read to you what came up. This was the top entry. No, no, I'm telling you because we're going to fight it. The top entry was, feminists can't have it both ways on Gold Coast meter maids. That was the top entry. And they've misunderstood. We can have it all the ways we fucking like. They've, uh, Bill Ochi from the Brisbane Times. You're not even on the Gold Coast, Bill Ochi. Brisbane's a whole other place. Now, if you were listening globally, I need to explain what meter maids are. Now, when I was growing up, I didn't know it wasn't absolutely standard everywhere in the world... I had no idea. If you're parking your car and you're just about to put money in the meter, that there was a, always a possibility that a lovely lady, a pair, they came pairs, lovely lady, two lovely ladies, 
would not rush up to you wearing rather small bikinis and stilettos with a sash that said meter made and say, oh, let me do that for you. That is what I assumed. And sometimes you'd be coming back to the car and you'd see, oh, somebody's running back, you know, like in London, it's sort of people always running back, it's back to the car. And so if you're listening to this in London, where a lot of our listeners are, in London, can you imagine if you're running back to your car and there's a parking inspector coming this way, traffic warden coming this way, and you think, oh God, and they're like quickly going to put the ticket on the car and you'd say, oh please, I've just got caught up. And they'd say, no, it's more than my job's worth, love. That's what would happen. Now, in the Nirvana paradise where I was raised, that wouldn't happen because two bikinied women <laughs> would say, stop there, we'll top up your meter for you. I was so surprised to go to other places and discover this was not a thing. In fact, this is not a thing anywhere else in the world, Gold Coast. And so I started looking at what was happening with meter maids now. And apparently, there's still a thing uh, in 2020. But when I was growing up, the government paid them to do it. And I'm very keen not to be the kind of feminist who says that women cannot commodify their bodies in a capitalist society. And I'm also very keen to say context is everything. So in Britain, we had page three models. And page three models... Uh, was in the context of the news, there is a topless woman on page three, and on the other side of the paper, there might be a female foreign secretary trying to get something done, and it recontextualizes women. So it's not saying there's no room for any woman to earn money if she wishes to, taking her top off. It is saying context is all. And I will question the context of the meter maids while also saying it's okay in a capitalist society for a woman to commodify itself. And that's why I can have it both ways. That's all I'm saying. Both ways. Both ways. Uh, The next story that came up under Feminist Gold Coast, it was about a man who'd gone on a Tinder date. The woman had died. She'd fallen from a building. He'd gone to court. They had not been able to prove. So he was found not guilty. The reason this comes up under feminism is because he went back on Tinder under a different name and some women who admittedly were on a Facebook group called Fucking Witches (laughs) said, it's a great name in my opinion, said, hey, this guy's gone on a different name and I think if you're going to date him, you need to know this story. And then he said, right, I'm going to sue you because you're not allowed to do that because I went to court and I wasn't found guilty. Now, my question for him, and I don't know that he did it, I wasn't there, but my question for him is, if I had been on a Tinder date and the other person had died in any way, shape or form, in any way, shape or form, I, I, I'd go, I'd try Bumble. <laughs> I just wouldn't go back on Tinder because it would be tainted, do you know what I mean? I just feel like, and if I had ever, if I'd gone to court or even heard a whisper about my name in the same sentence as Tinder Killer, RSVP, I hear, is a very good dating app. So here's the thing. I know there's feminists on the Gold Coast. I'm looking at 200 of them. And I know you're doing feminist things. I want to push those guys down in the search. I don't want men to be the top thing that comes up. And it's all about search engines. So I want you guys to put anything you do online and start hitting it for each other. Because when Gold Coast Feminist comes up or feminism comes up, I want to see all of the amazing stuff you're doing, the connections you're making, the feminist book club you're in, whatever it is you're doing, the work you're doing to encourage young girls on the Gold Coast here in schools, I want that to come up. And to be honest with you, it's only for the search ratings to get those fuckers off onto the second page. So I don't care if you make it up. <laughs> Feminist Festival, September. You don't have to have it. Just, <laughs> just click on it. Just click on it, gang. Push it up, push it up. I know we're all busy. We don't have time to run a Feminist Festival necessarily. <laughs> but when we do have time to do, click on it every single day. Every single day. I don't want to see either of those men's names ever again on the front page of Gold Coast Feminist. <laughs> So, does anyone here do anything feminist that they would like to tell us about? Yes? Um, I'm making a documentary about clits. I'm making a documentary about clits, if you didn't hear that. I mean, I'm not. That's what that person said, just to be very clear. I am not, but she is. That's very popular, the documentary about clitorises. That's, and where do you live? You live just outside of the Gold Coast. Is that like South Gold Coast, but out of the Gold Coast? We'll take it. We will take it. What was? 
You live near Byron Bay. So maybe later in the show, if I called on you, could you tell me about that? Absolutely. Great, super. Just so that we... Because if we all started clicking on the documentary about the clitoris... <laughs> So when anyone puts in, oh, Gold Coast, I'm going to the Gold Coast, I'm a feminist, I'd love to see what's happening there. Or maybe a men's rights activist going, ah, feminism is cats. Ah, what's happening? Ah, I hate feminists. What's going to come up? It's not, eh, hey, can't have it both ways. It will be, in fact, a documentary called, You Can Have It Twelve Ways. <laughs> and if you haven't got a name for the documentary yet, do you do? What is it? Uh, me and her. Me and her. Yeah. Is the her the clitoris? Yes. Great. Okay, super. Understood. Understood. Loving the name. Me and her. Has anyone else got any project or anything? Yes? Um, I work in birth as a doula, but I'm particularly passionate about working with women in domestic violence. I'd like to see the show on the website. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Oh, that's incredible. So you work as a doula, but you help women who are in relationships where there's domestic violence, who uh, are survivors of domestic violence, to give birth safely in a safe space. That's absolutely incredible. And have autonomy over their bodies so they can birth in the way that, in which they wish to, and nobody else is pressuring them. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's really great. What's your name? Jasmine. Jasmine. Okay, so we might talk to you a little bit later in the show as well. There's so much happening here. And it makes me so happy to come back to the Gold Coast and have so many people come out to a feminist event and then find out all of these different individuals. And I know that many of you didn't put your hands up but are doing absolutely incredible things. And if you have, you're a cisgendered man and you've come here tonight, you are very welcome. Thank you so much for coming out. We're delighted. Can I just ask you, sir, did you, did you come? Oh, I know you. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, the only man in the audience is a friend. Um, <laughs> No, that's not true. I don't know you. What's your name? Mitch. Do you listen to the podcast, Mitch? You, do you? I love you, Mitch. <laughs> I believe in you. I believe you've been listening to the show. If you heard other men talking in a disparaging way about women when we weren't there, because the thing is, gang, we're never there when we're not there. So as a woman, I'm never in the room when I'm not in the room. So I don't know what happens then. So Mitch, if men were talking about women in an othering or disparaging way, would you speak up? What would you say? It's not a joke unless everyone can laugh at it. Oh, Mitch. Mitch. Oh, Mitch. I really hope you're single because your chances of pulling have really skyrocketed here. You single, Mitch? Recently single, Mitch. I'm going to need more information, Mitch. Mitch is recently single. Tell me more, Mitch. Uh, he's just looked at a woman and said, do you want to take over? Mitch, I'm halfway there. He just, he just looked at a woman and said, do you want to take over my story? Do you know how rare that is in a man, Mitch? Normally we're telling a story of our breakup and a man goes, actually, it was a Wednesday. You're like, fuck off. It's irrelevant to the story, I'm in tears. No, it wasn't the time you were in Caboolture because I was there then. Shut up! Try to share my pain with my friends. Stop, stop giving me random details. Yeah, but I just thought you'd like to know. Oh, you, it's good to be accurate. No, it isn't. Maybe that's just my marriage. Um, I don't want to make, let's make assumptions. Mitch. So, Mitch, why did you say, do you want to take over? Oh, because the person you've broken up with is sitting next to you. Oh, I see. Okay. This, is, this has taken a turn for the Jerry Spring again, hasn't it? This is not where we saw it going at all. But you've come out together to a feminist show. Oh, he got it for your birthday. <laughs> Mitch is the kind of boyfriend that breaks up with you and still takes you to the feminist comedy show after the breakup. Oh. Don't applaud yourself, Mitch. It's ruining it. She's holding onto him like a handbag in a crowded marketplace now. She's like... <laughs> She's realised, she's realised, he's like, I mean, I'm not saying you must reconsider, but I am saying there's very few men who've come out to the feminist show. What's your name? Charlotte. Charlotte. Well, look, I, I truly believe in Mitch and Charlotte. 
because I, th I think they're gonna, I think they have a future. I mean, it's good to take a break from anything. Sometimes when you take a break, you realize how good it is. And you stop that break immediately <laughs> and marry him now, live on stage. Yeah, I have got my celebrant's license. It would make for a great turn in the show. No pressure. I'm no, 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 seriously, seriously, no pressure to get married. No, I mean, marriage isn't really a feminist concept. It really came down from lines of women being passed as property from one man to another. I am neither endorsing it nor encouraging it, but also please do it, because it would be a great story. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm a feminist, but I am, no, don't. These people just have come out for some comedy as friends. Stop pressuring them, gang. They don't need this. They, no, Mitch and Charlotte just here for a night out. It's lovely. I genuinely do think that's the loveliest thing I've ever heard, though. I think you both are absolutely lovely. And whether you end up as friends or married with three children, which is not what we want. It's not what we want. No, you don't want any children. No, 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 me, 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 I've missed the turn off for that. I just think, you know, they are lovely. They are, if you've got them, lovely, well done. That's excellent. But also if you don't really want them, the environment could do without them. Let's be very honest. Yeah, is that why Mitch and Charlotte, have you decided you're not having children for the environment? Are these people the greatest people in the whole world? What is it that you do, Mitch? You work in a what? In a nursery, looking after children. <laughs> looking after other people's children. No, no, nurturing the next generation without fathering it. Oh my God, no, no, plants. You work, you work with plants. <laughs> Is it for the environment, Mitch? What was that? Making oxygen. Making oxygen. Mitch makes oxygen for a living <laughs> at a time when the world is being starved. All I'm saying is, you know that hashtag, not all men? Do you know the reason for that hashtag, Mitch? <laughs> He's the man that means it's not all men. Mitch, it's just Mitch. Uh, Charlotte, what do you do? You, you just finished a journalism degree and you work at Woolworths. I feel like you have a big future for journalism. Do you know what you could be doing, really, what's really needed now on the Gold Coast is feminist journalism. Um, and I believe the Brisbane Times are looking for people to write <laughs> articles about how feminism isn't a horrendous nightmare that should be brought to its knees because some feminists have discussions around meet mates. I'm just saying, pitch that article. Pitch that article, yeah. Are you on for it? Excellent. Charlotte, I look forward to reading that. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. Please put this date in your diary, Thursday the 11th of March at 8pm UK time, if you're on it or you can get to it. We're doing our special International Women's Day Week live stream extravaganza. Now, you can't come and see us live because of uh, lockdown. Normally, we'd go somewhere like the Palladium or the Barbican, but those venues are in London and you might not be. So wherever you are in the world, you can watch live from a screen you're probably holding right now. That's right, a screen you already own. And if that's not a convenient time because you live on the other side of the world or you've got a thing, you have 72 hours to have and to hold this show, yes, you can watch it in your own time. Guests include my fabulous co-pilot, Sindhu V, the excellent and extraordinary talent that is Maria Bamford. We've never had her on the podcast before. We are beside ourselves. And our brilliant musician, Grace Petrie, with some very special surprises. I'm not allowed to tell you, but I really want to. We are partnering with Stylist Magazine. I'm guest editing it. I'm a feminist, but I know I've got a rom-com hero job. I'm an editor of a magazine. That's right. One week only. Uh, but I am absolutely excited and thrilled. 10% of every ticket sold goes to Choose Love. So you're choosing love just by coming and joining us. And there will be some Choose Love content as well. Because we want to think about displaced women this International Women's Day. That date again, Thursday 11th of March, 8pm UK time. Get your tickets now by going to events.loopedlive.com slash guilty feminist or follow the link on the homepage at guiltyfeminist.com. Please come and join us. I want it to be a big, international, exciting thing to make up for the fact that we're in lockdown. We love you all. We can't wait to be a tribe and an army in a room with you again 
But until then, there's some great advantages here. Maria Bamford's beaming in from America. See you there. Are you ready to hear some stand-up comedy? <laughs> so please welcome the stage the incredible Steph Tesdall. Hello. Hello, beautiful people. I will just say... Uh, my boyfriend is here with his sister. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I can see, just for the people uh, who are listening back home, I'm not wearing shoes um, and I, I feel like I need to, to reference that to the people who can see me uh, because I know, you're right, um, I do have my ankles out like a slut. But <laughs> I just figure, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it. So... <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me, Mitch, my breasts are up here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm a proud Aboriginal woman. I really am. I'm very, very proud of my heritage. But I have noticed some things in Australia. There are certain observations that I've made. Uh, I noticed that, like, in Australia, the government treats blackfellas much like you would, like, like your finest set of silverware, you know? Like, if you've got special guests, Especially if you've got international visitors. Well, shine it up and show it off. <laughs> and for the rest of the time, just lock it up. <laughs> Thank you. That was the... <laughs> this is the weirdest response I've ever had to that joke. Because most time people go, oh, but at this time you went, yeah, no, true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think blackfellas are the funniest people in the world. I do. Oh, there's a way that we laugh. Like, when we get together, the way we laugh is like, I can't replicate it for you, right, but I can tell you a story. I, uh, my auntie used to work in this really, really remote community, right? And there was this old auntie there, and this old auntie got real sick, and she had to be emergency, had to have the Royal Flying Doctor Service come in and take her to the hospital to the nearest town, right? And at the time, the Royal Flying Doctor Service was sponsored by Westpac. So all of the community gathers around. This old auntie, she's real sick, it's a big emergency. She got to go. She can get fixed, but she got to go, right? Now, all of them are standing around to make sure everything goes all right, and she's getting put up on that stretcher to make sure she can get into that helicopter. All of a sudden, she starts kicking back. No, I won't go. I refuse. Everyone's going, Auntie, Auntie, we just want to make sure that you get better. If you don't go, then you're not going to get better, right? She goes, No, nah, I refuse. I'm not doing it. I'm not going. Arnie, you've got to go. We've got to make sure you're better. I won't go. Arnie, why? Because that's a Westpac plane and I'm with Commonwealth. Fuck yay! <laughs> <laughs> she just wanted to make the community laugh one more time before she had to go. And I love that because I reckon, like, I truly do. I think that, that laughter is the best way to deal with anything. They say that comedy is just tragedy plus time. And, oh, fuck, Australia Day's funny. Hey, um... <laughs> What, is that too soon? What? <laughs> I do like, to, like, my favourite thing is, like, I was kind of talking about it seriously before, but in, in a real sense, I do love to watch white guilt happening in real life. <laughs> Nothing is sweeter and yet more filling. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving. I was recently in Perth and <laughs> I was staying <laughs> in an Airbnb and I had to, like get my key out of this lockbox, and this guy sees me trying to get into this lockbox. And he goes, get on you go, you're not supposed to be here. You know that's not yours, right? And I went, I'm staying at the Airbnb. And he looked at me like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then he said, oh, it's not because you're... And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is worse. Like, it's getting worse. <laughs> And when I watched him trembling in his boots going, I'm a piece of shit, my whole day was made. Um, and see, I don't drink or touch drugs, right? Like, I literally, I don't drink at all, right? Uh, but that, that is my crack. That's... I have to get, you know, I have to get at least one fix of that every week, otherwise I start getting the shakes. And so I, um, I have made sure that I can consistently get my feeling of white guilt. So what I like to do now is I like to go to like a really hipster cafe, right? And what I'll do is I'll find the biggest hipster that I can find, uh, which is somebody who smells of beans and is wearing Birkenstocks. And I... 
I will wait behind them in line, right? And it takes a bit of patience, but it's worth it. And, and I'll, I'll just wait for them to order a smashed avo, right? And then I go, what the fuck did you just call me? And you watch them squirm and it's the fucking best. That's what shit. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to finish this up real quickly, but I just have to... My, my fella, because he's here, I've got to tell you this, right? He's, like, he's the most beautiful... He really is. He's the most beautiful thing. And, like, I just... I love him to pieces, right? We work because we're opposites. That's how we go, right? But it's real cute because he's a ginger and he's from England. And, like, he's like my little older... English gentleman, right? And he, um, <laughs> it's beautiful, you know. I feel like a kept woman. Don't call me that, Martin. It's actually quite racist. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of my favourite things about him is, right, when he moved to Australia about 15 years ago, just so happened to be the first people that he made friends with were black fellas, right? So now he thinks he is one, like he just fucking loves black people. And I love this because he gets real guilty around Australia Day. And he's talking to me going, sometimes I feel real bad about what happened in the past. And I saw him with these beautiful little freckles and I said, hey, I said, hey, you don't need to feel guilty. Look at you, you got dot painting in your skin there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, look at your skin's telling the story of our rainbow serpent. <laughs> You're more cultured than me, you little kitty. <laughs> and I keep on thinking, because I'm real clucky, like I just turned 27. And I keep on going, I want to have babies, right? But then I keep on trying to imagine what the fuck that would mix. <laughs> Because you'd see that thing, you go, what the fuck is it? Is it wearing a hat? <laughs> Pauline? I don't know. You know, you'd be like a ginger Aboriginal. Help with the... And so I came up with a couple of different names of what you'd call that, because scientists would want to know. So I've got a... <laughs> i got a few different ideas. Uh, I thought, uh, firstly, we could go with, like, gingeriginy. <laughs> or, uh, or maybe... Aboriginal. <laughs> I like this one because it sounds quite formal. Um, please meet our indigenous child. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I think I've chosen. I think I've nailed it. I, I've gone with boomeranger. <laughs> but um, I think that'll do me. <laughs> Thank you. The incredible stuff. guest today is a comedian, television host and columnist. She's a past recipient of the Director's Choice Award at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. You may have seen her on The Project, The Weekly, or as co-host of The Great Australian Bake Off. Please welcome to the stage and welcome to the stand-up mic, Mel Butto! Oh, thanks. Thanks for clapping, because that's a long walk. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gold Coast, for coming out. Appreciate this. I feel, uh, whoa, mamma mia. <laughs> when Deb was like, can you do some feminist stand-up? I'm like, oh, ma no. <laughs> I got a lot of jokes about my mum, and I hate her, so no. Um, so I'll just talk about my dog and myself. Easier. Um, but no, I thank you. Thank you for coming out. I, I, I do want to talk about uh, something that's probably very obvious to all of you, is that I date women, but it's, um, it may not be clear from where you're sitting up the back. You might not be able to see my shoes. They're very practical. They're, they're perfect for a walk around Bunnings. <laughs> Adopting a rescue dog in these, very easy. Some people still don't get that I'm gay. They're like, oh, I just thought you were <laughs> sporty. No. <laughs> no, I'm not wearing these shoes to get extra traction to suck cock later. You know what I mean? <laughs> Good, we're on the same page, Gold Coast, very good. <laughs> I do, I do date birds. Didn't always, used to be on solids back in the day, but... Um... <laughs> uh, slippery slope. <laughs> Quite literally, isn't it? But, um... Can't, can't get out. But I, uh, I don't know where to stand. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing stand-up in, like, a living room, but also a press conference. Anyway, um... <laughs> Right, back to you, Deb. Um, 
I only got my first girlfriend about five years ago. <laughs> that went well. Had to tell my parents and uh, I, I split them up. I told them separately, right? And my friends were like, oh, I don't know about that. What, like, what order are you going to tell? Mum first or dad first? I was like, oh, I'm going to tell dad first, right? And they're like, nah, wrong. No, 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 no. <laughs> Do not tell your ex-military father that you're gay before you tell your mum. That's the wrong way around, Mel. I was like, no, no, no. You've, no, you've got it the wrong way around. My dad is ex-Navy. He is going to get this. <laughs> he totally did as well. I was like, Dad, I don't know how to explain this, but I just fell in love with my best friend, Sophie. He's like, yep, yep, been there, done that. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, must, uh, must give Bruce a call. <laughs> the fuck's Bruce? Um... I just don't reckon my dad has a sexuality. I don't know if my dad's gay or not. I don't think he is. Like, he, he goes out with women and stuff. But I just think that generation just, just doesn't have... He, he, like, if I said to my dad, Dad, do you want a dick or a pussy? Or do you want to cut down the tree and hide it in the neighbour's recycling bin? He'd be like, the bin, the bin, I'll take the fucking bin. Yep, yep. <laughs> So I told mum, told mum that I was uh, dating women and she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I was like, why is that mum? And she goes, oh, you played a lot of hockey, didn't you? So, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. My name is Mel Bustle, Bustle, everybody. So I just want to talk a bit about invisibility. Yes. Tell me about your wedding, when you started planning your wedding. Right. So, when... Because equal yeah. marriage has only been... Re- it's oh. quite recent here. Yeah, so. yesterday. Anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's really recent. I think it was 2018, from memory, it was, it was approved. What happened is I did not expect this at all because I've got heaps of uh, very progressive friends, young friends, gay friends, and that no one just seemed to give much of a fuck that I was getting married to a woman, obviously, and I thought, oh, it'll pick up as we get closer, as we sort of, it'll, you know, people organise something, some sort of hen's night or whatever, because I've put in so many hours into every other arsehole's wedding over the years. No, just nothing. It was this weird thing, Deb, of just like this assumption that because it was a gay wedding, oh, it'll just be something small, will it? Why? No. And See, it was... I don't think people think of that about gay men's weddings. No. I, for gay men, if two but gay men get married... I assume it's going to be fabulous, rightly. Yes, correctly. Yeah. Yes, correct. It's, but that's interesting that that's an intersection of feminism then, that if two lesbians get married, you think sometimes people think they're not going to want to fuss. Yes. And you did want to fuss. I wanted a huge fuss. <laughs> it just didn't... Ha- and I, I moved house recently. I found one... We got one engagement card. That's it. One. Like, and this is including, like, our parents. And there's no, like trick here there's like everyone liked my partner all our families all got on we were we were together for like six years it was a long time but it was just this invisibility of like to speak what it was it felt like they didn't it wasn't a real wedding in inverted commas Mm. to them or something or I was like at some point someone's going to care and just didn't seem to pick up do you think that that will change like that's really interesting to hear I have three brothers and two of them are gay and I know that Weirdly enough, one of them did get married, I think. <laughs> you think? You think? Yeah, so, so he was dating somebody who lived in America and it was just before gay marriage was legal. And so they had to do like a civil partnership. Uh, yes, But yes. it was legal in America. Yep. So I was like, because they didn't actually end up lasting. And I said, do you have to get a divorce? And he's like... Fuck no. It's like, he doesn't even know if they were married. It was very weird. Mm, mm, mm. Um, but I know for a fact that if he was to get married to his partner at the moment, exactly what you said, Deb, it would be like that. Do you think that this will change? Like, do you think that in a couple of years it's likely to change? Or I don't know. Is I it think... the way that you... Like, how did you tell everyone that you were engaged? Just, like, phone calls and messages and stuff. And people were excited then... What about, because so, I've met your partner, your ex-partner. Oh, my God. Wow, sorry. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, sorry. It's they right. might just be, if you're recently single, that's the theme of the show. <laughs> so, basically, in the third row is our very own Ross and Rachel. 
<laughs> they are currently oh. on a break. They, these two here? Yeah. These, yep. oh, but much yep. like Ross and Rachel, we believe they will end up together. Yes. Although I think we do need to be realistic about Ross and Rachel in Friends. They would be divorced by now and Ross would be a men's rights activist. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. He was very angry. He was, <laughs> yeah, he was an angry man. Yeah, I, I'm not single at the moment because Lezos move on really quick. Um, <laughs> so don't worry, I'm full into it with another girl. <laughs> Uh, yes, Steph. Sorry, because I, yeah, I, yes, I didn't... Yes, I know you know, Sophie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I, so I knew your ex. Did people react differently to her? Uh, were they excited for her? Yeah, like, no. was there... No. Her no. family, no, could not get... No so one it was gave like a shit. you both had the same... Yeah. And then it was even more frustrating that no one cared or did any organised a single fucking thing or... Or, you know, all this hype and Instagram hype that everything seems to get mm. these days. And mm. we're going dress shopping, live video. None of that. Like, I just went dress shopping with my mum and she was like, oh, do you want me to put it on my credit card? <laughs> yes. <laughs> she was like, oh, I don't know what the etiquette is in this situation. I was like, you just fucking pay for it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but no, and then when we, it was so, so sad, of course, when we called it off and then broke up and then. Like, I got, like, one text message from my dad then as well. Like, just like, oh, well, uh, things will turn around. Plenty will fish in the sea. Like, that was it. Mm. And then on the day that we were scheduled to be married, where we weren't married, that day, just nothing. No one was like, oh, I hope you're okay. And I was like, oh. I was like, hmm. Generally, do you feel sometimes... Some lesbians have said to me that they feel kind of sometimes lower profile in the gay community. Yes, it's sort of like, unless you're immediately visibly obvious as a lesbian, it's still this awkward... I choose my battles. I'm not going to fight with every Uber driver who is like, oh, you're going out to meet some boys? I'll just be like, sure, yes, of course. I'm sure there'll be males there. Um, (laughs) I've recently had quite a big epiphany, I guess, and I've been really working at, like, undoing a whole lot of prejudices Mm -hmm. that exist within me. It's what my show's about. (laughs) See ya. Um, I... (laughs) I've been trying to unlearn these prejudices. What I realised recently, I used to have this conversation with my brother. Now, my brother is incredibly masculine. He trains with a bodybuilder. He is a doctor. He has a deep voice. And I said to him, like the ignorant see with an aunt that I am, I said to him, you are so straight. And he went, no, I am literally the gayest man you'll ever meet. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes... I don't even like women. (laughs) He was like, at least gay men have friends with women. I don't like them. I put up with you. And (laughs) no, but like he said, you know, like I have never, ever been in love with a woman. I've never had any, you know, I'm a gay man. What you're talking about is the stereotype that you think exists that only came about as a way to signal to others your otherness so you could connect with others. Yes. And I was like, that's fascinating. And what I realised is that I had been incredibly accepting of my brothers and their homosexuality completely, but I used to have this real issue if people ever questioned whether I was a lesbian. Oh. And I have no idea why, because I couldn't give a flying fuck. Like, it's not like I have any issues with lesbians, but the idea for myself that I would be looked at that way. Like in primary school, were kids like, or oh, whatever, your brother's gay, so you're gay. Like that? No, no, no. No, no like it, they weren't out until after high school. Right. I just, I was a tomboy. And mm. so I always had this idea that, oh, people are going to think that it's like this, therefore, like this is going to take me out of the Do market Do you think it was because you felt that there was already enough stereotypes projected upon you and as you weren't a lesbian, you didn't want another stereotype that might marginalise you? I actually have no idea. Like, I really... I still don't know. And I actually had a, an amazing... This, this was the conversation that started me trying to unpack these prejudices, was I met with... I don't know if you guys know her. If you don't search her... I can't remember her last name, though, which doesn't help, but Faustina Fuzzy... Fuzzy yeah. Agoli. It, she's a Blasian, as I called her. Her dad is Ghanaian. Her mum is Chinese... She grew up in Australia and she recently came out. Yes, yep. I did this whole chat with her and she said to me, yeah, well, until I was 25, I guess I thought I was straight. And then I fell in love with a woman and went, oh, no, this feels way more natural. I just never challenged that part of my brain. And she thought, like, she said to me, because she had grown up with two 
cultures that she thought were quite conservative, although they actually happened to be totally fine with it, she just thought, I better not fuck with this. Mm. And so Mm. she never challenged it. And it was only that she fell in love so deeply in a way she hadn't before that she came to realise. And I went, oh, why would I care if I just fell in love with someone? Mm -hmm. It should be that simple. But I guess what I'm asking is, like, is there more of a stigma on... Okay, so you know how, like, incels and stuff go... You're not really a lesbian. You don't oh, know yeah, until yeah, you've yeah. had a dick. Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. Yes. You know, like, that's not me saying that. Somebody said, oh, my God, I'm sorry. That's like a, you know, insult. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Have you it's, seen that? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. men who say they're involuntarily celibate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who say, basically, women owe them sex. They sometimes say to lesbians, you're not really a lesbian. You just haven't had sex with a man. Yes. Or you, so, and, yeah. that, and that seems to be more common than... When, like, nobody says to a gay man, you just haven't had sex with a woman yet. Oh, of right? course. Yeah. And so do you think that there is some basis of you not being, not you personally, but, like, quite as accepted that does actually come down to this idea of where women fit in our idea of, of status well, and that sort of thing? I think it, in, maybe because it just stung me more because I probably knew it might be true, but in, like, high school, if some, being a leso would be the worst thing you could possibly be. Like mm. the worst, like, and it, my I would my face would go red if anyone accused me of it, and would and maybe because I knew it was true or something, but also like now you just see, I get this look from men sometimes when they find that out, they just like totally dismiss you. So not a, in their eyes, they go, not only are you a fucking woman, you don't even want to root me. Oh, and it they <laughs> just this like total lack of interest. Then I'm frustrated by the other side because. I don't get booked on queer gigs that often for some reason because I'm maybe not good enough at being a gay. And I'm like, well, this bloke reckons I'm real good at it and he <laughs> hates my guts. So I'm like, you can't so, yeah, win. If you, if you don't have very masculine gender expression, mm. you can be seen as not lesbian enough to be booked on a queer gig. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what we're saying is lesbians need to have more visibility and if a lesbian in your life says she's getting married... Please make a fuss <laughs> and organise an incredible hen night. Yes. <laughs> Mel Puffle, everybody. Thank you. Hi there. This is Tom Zielinski, the producer of the podcast. When I'm not producing The Guilty Feminist, I present a podcast of my own. I'm a writer and I'm also a corporate coach and I'm running one of my storytelling sessions over Zoom this Wednesday, the 3rd of March at 2pm. These are aimed at people in business who have to communicate ideas, whether it's sales or speaking at conferences or delivering training or anything like that, where maybe you struggle to get your point across, convince people that you're right, or just explain complicated ideas in an easy-to-follow way. And we find that taking that material and thinking about it as a story really helps. So the course is a couple of hours long. It's very interactive. There's lots of things for you to do as well as think about. And we're offering a special discount for Guilty Feminist listeners. If you go to the-spontaneity-shop.com and follow the links to open courses, when you find the storytelling course on Wednesday, you can use the code word GUILTY0321. GUILTY0321 and get a special £75 rate instead of the normal £95. So we'd love to see you there. Two o'clock, Wednesday, the 3rd of March. Storytelling for anyone involved in business. And get £20 off with that passcode. See you there. The lady has the film about the clitoris. Do you think you could pitch it to us in a minute and tell us what we could do to help? Yes, what's your name? Vicky. Vicky, do you want to just come up to the front and we'll give you a mic? Great. So just tell us about your project, give us the top line, and if there's anything this audience can do to help or get involved, that would be great. So I've made a documentary about yes. clits. I interviewed 53 women from all over Australia from the age of 15 to 76. Wow. And uh, I asked them all questions about the clitoris and their experiences with her. And um, I turned it into a 40-minute documentary. And it explores everything from religion 
to how they found her, to past sexual experiences, to politics and the big P and all the really fun stuff. Sorry, what's the big P? The patriarchy. Oh, yeah. sorry. So, sorry, the big P, yeah, the, the oh, patriarchy. Yeah, I yeah. didn't think that either. Oh, did you not? Oh, good. Yeah, the big P. I didn't want to ask because I thought everyone else knows. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to ask someone later what's yeah. the big P. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were talking about penis. Yeah. Yeah. I, I said that. And I thought, <laughs> don't, I thought, don't question it. She'll keep going. It'll be fine. See, maybe I was trying to be a bit too cool there. Like, the big P, <laughs> the like, big we P. get that as feminists. But yeah, yeah. The, big, the big P, the patriarchy. And um, it's premier in Brunswick Heads on the 27th of February. Nice. And I think it's my Wonderful. first one. And will it be streaming anywhere so that the audience can see it online? Yeah, so we're going to input it into a few uh, feminist film festivals after that. And then basically if you go to the website, I can send a private link while it's in the film festival circuit so you can watch it at home and have a little clit showing of your own and like <laughs> there, there is no clits in it but like there's not any visual clits no, in sure, it great. Yeah. Okay, great. a lot of men ask me that like do you do you actually no, see it but you don't and, yeah. yeah no, no. All good <laughs> so what's what's it called it's called me and her me and her and at some point it'll be streaming but what's the website well my it's a vicky j v-i-c-k-y-j-a-y dot com forward slash me and her and then uh hopefully it'll get a showing on the gold coast that would be great yes and then Lovely. we will push up the, <laughs> the Google, Google search. Yeah. Uh, Vicky, everybody. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> and um, is, she a, is she a jury or a mm. Liverpudlian? Where are you from, Vicky? Um, originally from uh, Newcastle in England. Fucking Newcastle, York. yeah. She's a Geordie. And the other person there who was working with, uh, as a doula with women with domestic violence, have you got something you could just tell us in a minute and maybe how we could help? So I'm a doula, so I work with birthing women and my passion is for women to have autonomy with their bodies to birth where they want and how they want and I was lucky enough to work with the Sanctuary Women, Children and Pets Refuge on the Gold Coast and um, this isn't this isn't my organisation but I love what they're doing and these women have come from domestic violence situations and some of these women decide to leave when they're pregnant. It's a time in their lives when they think, actually, no, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I've got this baby coming and they make a big change. And they come into a place where they have nowhere to live and no support when they're pregnant. And I was lucky enough to volunteer there with some women who were birthing and it's amazing what they're doing. And so how we can help, they have a Facebook page. So you can just look up the Sanctuary Women, Children and Pets Refuge. So these women can take their pets, which is oh, very rare. Yeah. And their website is sanctuaryrefuge.com.au. So Simone there is running it all by herself. She oh. works 20-hour days. She's amazing. Does she need money? Yes, they used to have a GoFundMe page. I'm not sure if they still do that, but through the website you can donate directly anyway Great. if it's not GoFundMe. And if you had a little fundraiser, something that you could do, you know, you can do things at home, you just do things with a few mates, you could have a trivia night, something like that. If you could all organise something just locally... What about at the screening, if somebody does like a talk up the top of the screening or something? Oh, for the clitoris? Yeah. Could we combine these two? Could we have a Gold Coast clitoris screening and then we raise money? <gasps> Wait, this is Vicky, brilliant. This Vicky is how Feminists Connect. What, what did you say, Vicky? Uh, well, we're, we're raising money um, against female genital mutilation. Oh, okay. Could we, could we do another screening at the Gold Coast to raise money for the sanctuary? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, so, Vicky, we'll connect you two and then you put the details on your website and also we'll try and get the details on the sanctuary page as well. Now, what we need is everybody to be putting that... Oh, so many clicks. So many clicks, getting that. And then we're literally... Oh, what's happening? Sorry, Feminism on the clits. No, I didn't say clits. I said clicks. <laughs> but thank you. Um, it, so that we're... Oh, what's happening on the Gold Coast? Wow, a fundraiser with a film about the clitoris and the money is going to this amazing shelter. Gold Coast is throbbing with feminism. <laughs> incredible act for you now she's come all the way from the uk 
Uh, she's a wonderful singer-songwriter. Put your hands together and make incredible Gold Coast welcoming Guilty Feminist Noises for the wonderful Grace Petrie! <laughs> Gold Coast! How are you doing? Good. I'm, uh, I also don't have any shoes on because I got here to do the sound check at, at half past four and it went, all went to plan, so I, I had loads of time. So I said to Jeff, um, oh, I'm just going to go for a walk on the beach. <laughs> Did anybody see the weather before the show? Yeah, that was good. Um... I seem to have brought the weather from Britain with me wherever we go. It's pissed it down in Sydney, it pissed it down in Brisbane, and it pissed it down the moment I stepped onto the beach. Um, and I, I only had one pair of shoes with me, so um, I am barefoot here. But um, it leads me to uh, the song that I'm going to sing for you. Because um, uh, we were talking, obviously, about gay marriage. Uh, we, obviously, uh, we have gay marriage in, in the UK, but not without its opposition. Are you, uh, how familiar are, are you, forgive me, uh, Australia, if I am patronising you, but I don't know how closely... Uh, the politics are, but um, uh, you, would you know who I mean by UKIP? Yeah, yeah far right cunts, basically, um, uh, in British politics. Um, and uh, so a few years ago, um, we were experiencing quite a lot of flooding in the southwest of England, and a UKIP councillor said that the reason for that flooding was that that was God's revenge for same sex marriage being legalised, right? <laughs> And it so happened that I was due to, uh, to sing on a topical radio programme on the BBC that week, so I decided to sing a song about that. And it was the same week that uh, Jeremy Clarkson, are you familiar with Jeremy Clarkson? Yeah, far right cunt from the TV in Britain. Um, and uh, and he, uh, this, it was the same week uh, that he um, got into trouble for using the word gay as an insulting term on Twitter to his, at the time, 2.8 million Twitter followers. So I wrote a song about it, and, uh, and it is called, this is genuinely the title, it is called I Do Not Have the Power to Cause a Flood. Um, my time in Australia so far would suggest that that is not fucking true, to be honest with you. Um, but I will, I will sing it anyway. Try and make it come true, guess like this. I do not have the power to cause a flood. I'm not like Storm from X-Men who so easily could manipulate the weather, causing havoc where he stood. But if I had the power to cause a flood, I would. Send the flood to Russia right to Putin's door The waves of my destruction spanning miles To wash away the prejudice and then never more Will he make statements that equate us all to pedophiles But instead give all pussy right a day But if I only had the power to cause a flood I would send one to Uganda where be said and he says Gay and bi and trans up normal what he's content to throw them all in jail A life sentence of repentance But you can be sure That me 70 definitely would Know it if I had the power to cause a flood And for Jeremy Clarkson It's all just a bit of fun For our highly paid celebrities To use language of bigotry and then make no apology Because no one sees a link between The things he thinks it's fine to tweet And people yelled at in the street And kids abused in every school And the time my windows got bricked through And Putin and me 70 But you keep up for Jeremy And banter from the top here lads It's PC gone fucking mad And that's all just fine and good But if I had the power to cause a flood You can bet I Thank you very much. Thanks, gang. It's nice to be home. You have been listening to the Guilty Fabulous with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Jeff Tisdale, and our very special guest, Mel Muscle. Live music from Grace Petrie. The Guilty Fabulous theme tune is by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producers were Tom Sinski from Spontaneity Shop and Jeff Green from Australian Property Management. Thanks to everyone at Miami Mount Kettle as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit GuiltyFabulous.com!
um, stories where it's like, you know, some people, I feel like some people get a, a, a passion or a, um, or a, what's, what can I find words? Where are they? Taken them. No. Um, <laughs> like my land. No, sorry. Don't know. <laughs> just want, I just wanted that, Deb. I just wanted that. Don't pause it. <laughs> I just wanted that. That's my favourite sound. Um, <laughs> No, I, you know what? Some, sometimes people get. 